Alan Rosenquist, and welcome to Character in Context, where this week I'm, you know, we're not going to do the normal stuff. I guess next week I'm probably going to finish up um, the Gospel of Mark. I was going to do it in two um, sections, but I don't think I've got enough material. I've got it half written, and I'm still recovering. <laughs> from the Surge Conference, which was excellent, which is actually what we're going to talk about today. And after I finish up Mark, I need to redo an old teaching about um, resources for studying and how to use them, how not to use them. I'm going to talk about issues like um, proof texting, cherry picking, eisegesis versus exegesis, just stuff, you know, it's not obviously going to be a college level course because I haven't taken a college level course in that. But it's just something to kind of help out people who kind of, you know, want to not just be trapped at or, or especially under the level of, you know, the people that are teaching them and kind of at the mercy it's like well did this person know what they're talking about are they misusing the text what well, you know um not that we will ever stop misusing the text because isn't that what we do as humans and we are kind of silly and i'm gonna make a bunch of noise here moving my chair but i want to talk about the surge conference that i was at two weeks ago and um you know it was about two months, I think, before my nervous breakdown a year ago, which was about just about exactly a year ago, that she asked me to do this. And um, it's her first conference, Sarah Kiefer. Um, and she, but that's what she does, actually. She, she designs, you know, things for, it, it, she's really good at it. I couldn't believe how well her first women's conference went. And it was just a delight and um, all the fears that I had about freaking out or panicking or um, not being able to talk or, or, you know, all my worst fears. Um, no, none of it happened. And everyone was awesome. Um, it, you know, she's going to throw another one next year. Oh, my gosh. I'm telling you, be there. It was really worth it. She did an incredible job. And the women there were wonderful. I met people that have been on my Facebook wall or have been listening to my radio program who've only known for email or social media for, for years. And um, it was just, it was such a delight. And um, the messages that were um, delivered really um pretty much meshed together really well and some of us actually changed what we were going to talk about at the last minute and I was one of them Ryan White was another and then Hulda Dawid um she also and and the changed messages that we did all, all mesh so it's like you know the Holy Spirit was really really on top of things that we could but I want to tell you about how the whole trip went and we had some miracles and you know, it's, it's inevitable that after that kind of weekend with the focus on unity, that was so successful and we, you know, everyone was unified. You didn't have, you know, it was just, it was, it was great. Um, and <laughs> this is why I go with a script, honestly. But we started out, I started out with a plane flight in and I left, you know, early in the morning. And fortunately the airport is, is my local airport. So it's like, you know, 10 minutes away from my house. Flew into Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, of course, as is usual on, on a long flight, um, I tore my, I ruptured my right eardrum and that's been happening to me ever since January so this is the fifth flight in a row where I have ruptured one or both eardrums and uh, that's not fun and it's left it left me with with a weakness and so <laughs> I, I ruptured it again you know it doesn't matter how much gum I chew and I had those special you know 
balancing earplugs and and all that and uh, didn't matter didn't matter still uh, still ruptured that right eardrum because that's the one that never really healed correctly and, I, and so I tend to get ear infections in that since since that happened but um got there um met Charlie Brown um who runs the rooted cafe awesome lady picked me up at the airport uh got in met my friends d and sarah who i've known forever and um connie and amy gunther and uh oh gosh just so many people who i have known over the internet who i haven't met um ryan white one of my best friends in the world came in that night and um had great speakers that night and um I'll tell you something. There, there was a new speaker for me who I'd never met. Now we're fast friends. And it's like you have these connections with certain people who you'd never met before. And um, her name is uh, Hulda Dawid. And she um, she runs Her Royal Roots um, Ministry. And she's just so smart and such an incredible presenter. She's only 35 years old. You know, she's almost 20 years younger than me, which is you know, hard to admit. And she's just got it going on. And, um, oh man, you know, you have a chance to hear her speak. She does an incredible job. And it was when she, um, she got up and she, um, she said that, um, Hebrew is a proto Canaanite language that is like, oh my gosh, she knows her stuff and she is courageous and she's brave. She did, um, she did talks about Hebrew and about the Ezer Konegda, the um, the um, you know phrase improperly translated in some Bibles as "help meet." Um, but you know that's not why we're here to talk about. This is just me kind of shooting the breeze. So I met her, and like she brought her entire family of women. <laughs> and friends and oh gosh this this group of women they were they were amazing and they uh they were like they were at almost they were at three out of my four um presentations all the, except for the very last one where they went to hers instead which i totally don't blame them because if i hadn't been speaking i would have gone to her um talk as well but they were really animated they were the kind of people that's really fun to talk to and you know i was i was worried about the presentations i uh i hadn't spoken um publicly without a script um since since my strokes in nine in 2017 um because i lose words and and, and it's been a real challenge for me so I was nervous so I had scripts for everything except for one of my talks because I just didn't want everyone to be waiting for me for five minutes for me to come up with the noun that has disappeared from my head but I did talks on polemics and polemics is um you know insults and insults in the bible as opposed to greco-roman insults and um the way Yeshua, um, Jesus did them and, and the difference of purposes and, and how we abuse the idea of insulting people because we think it's biblical, but we don't understand the function and we don't understand how it was done and why and what it meant. And it wasn't out of frustration. It was, you know, a lot of times it was, um, it was hearkening back to scripture in ways that, you know, it wouldn't make sense exactly if it wasn't the Messiah doing it or John the Baptist. Um, but anyway, and then my second talk was um, sex and the married believer. And I was glad that some single people showed up because it was really more um, to help people um, kind of overcome the bad evangelical teachings out there about um, how wives owe husbands sex on demand, can't say no to their husbands, um, 
dealing with issues of marital rape. I think, and, and I'll tell you something, that sounds really heavy, but we were screaming and laughing during a lot of it. And I'll tell you something, Ryan White is the bravest person that I've ever met because I kept telling him, I said, don't show up to this man. Don't show up. <laughs> and I was three minutes into the presentation and I see him walking. Because, you know, this is a women's conference. He is the only guy there except for uh, some of the musicians and um, who showed up briefly and the guy in the kitchen. Um, and I see him walking past the uh, the windows. And I said, oh, no, he didn't. Every woman turns around and looks. I said, there's the bravest man who ever lived. And having him there was great. We um, When we were speaking, we would take shots at each other just because we tease each other. And it's, it's fun. And we know. And it was all in good fun. And everyone got it. Um, but uh, no, I'll give him kudos. And then what else did I talk about? I talked about... Um, idolatry um idolatry in the ancient world versus idolatry today and i gave one other talk oh my my main session was um women in the biblical world and that's the one that i changed at the last minute i mean for a year i'd been i'd been planning on doing women in the ancient world um, but I tried to write it over and over and over again. Tried to do the PowerPoints. Couldn't. Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't. And then about two weeks before the conference, uh, the Lord, you know, prompts me to pay full price for uh, a certain book. And if you know me, you know I do not pay full price for books unless there's like no other alternatives. I am the queen of the Kindle sale. I even have a group on Facebook dedicated to listing um, the sales on the kind of books that I study so that people can maybe pay, you know, sometimes like $3 for like a $30 book or um, something like that. And so I bought this book called... Um, Helpmates, Harlots, and Heroes. And it just blew my mind. And it tied together a lot of the stuff I'd been researching over the past year. And I said, okay, now I, I understand why I couldn't write it. And here we're going to do this. And I was putting my PowerPoints together. And I, I was trying to come up with um, women from the Bible stories depicted uh, as uh, black or brown because, you know, they did not look like me. Um, I look like my ancestors lived in caves and um, never went outside and um, bathed in sunblock 50 every day, you know, and you got these people in the story of the Bible, those, those books that you find at the doctor's office, remember those? And the people in them were so white, looked like they were never outside. <laughs> You know, they were not an agrarian people. That's that's for sure. And so I was trying to find these these images for my PowerPoints. It's like, good grief. Why do all these and, and, and so many of them were like wearing makeup. It's like, oh, come on, guys. So but finally, finally, I uh, found um, art of brown and black women um, for and, and they were like dressed up, you know, it, it was specifically done as though they were, you know, biblical characters. Um, and, and so I put all these PowerPoints in and, and I had no idea of, I didn't know who a lot of the other speakers were and I, I let's see pictures and so Hulda Dawid and, um, and her family, um, they're black. And so they come in and I've got my PowerPoints up and they, they look and they come immediately sit in the front front row, except I think they told me they split up because they didn't want me to feel like they were getting fun. <laughs> oh, but they're the most delightful people. Um, and, and I gave the talk and man, it was so, it went so well. And I presented um, the stories of the women in the Bible from a woman's perspective, which is not what we're used to. Okay. One, you know, the Bible's androcentric, which means it was written as male centered because it was written to a world that was male centered. If you'd given them a document that was more like something we'd see today, it wouldn't have made sense to them. It would have been weird. 
And God communicates with us where we are. And there's nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, it's really the only sane way to get his points across to us. But um, gave the presentation and I was able to explain how um, feminist Bible scholarship isn't, it doesn't mean the same thing it means in politics. It means from a woman's point of view. And also womanist scholarship, which is from a black or brown woman's point of view. And we all see scripture very differently. And, and certainly women, whether we're, we're white or brown or black, we're going to read scriptures with different eyes than, well, the majority of biblical scholarship that we read in the West um, is um, educated white European. Um, and we've learn to absorb that and internalize that as, as though that's the only legitimate way to look at the Bible. Um, but it isn't. I mean, obviously, we need all these points of views because I'll tell you something. When I read scholarship from, from African commentators, they see things in the Bible that I would never see. And it's actually closer to the people who actually lived then in terms of living under oppressive governments, um, having to deal with things like famine um, and war that we just can't really relate to here. Um, and I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm grateful that I can't relate to it, but we also miss things. And so I, I love to read African scholarship and theology, love it. Um, and, and Asian scholarship and theology, love it, love it, love it. And, and I'm also really enjoying feminist and womanist scholarship because man, I just see things now that I didn't see before. And it's, it really has enhanced my understanding and, um, seemed to go over really well. And so the next day I did the sex and the married believer. And here's where I want to talk to you about the miracle that happened. Cause this is so cool. At this point, I'd met Hulda, and um, and we hit it off really well. Our, our our vendor tables were set up right next to each other, and I was a, and I was really bummed that I wasn't like right next to Ryan because Ryan and I like to gap because <laughs> you know we don't see each other very often, but we talk on online a lot, but. Um, but I was next to Hulda and oh my gosh, you know, there are just some people in your life who you immediately feel like you were separated at birth spiritually. And I felt that way about her. And, um, we just, we hit it off. And like I said, she's so smart and so outgoing and, um, she's shy like me. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, and it surprises people when a lot of the people who do speaking at these things are incredibly painfully shy and but we do it because we love god and we god is acting against type and he equips us in certain ways that even though under normal circumstances it's the last thing we would want to be doing we do it and it's a it's a sign of his calling and his grace to equip us in situations that we would have no earthly business being in. So after my Sex and the Married Believer class, I, I had to uh, minister to a few ladies because whenever I talk about this, I, you know, the horror stories come out and women who have been abused in their marriages and who have never had any sort of mutual sexual relationship with their husbands who um who have even been um physically abused and mentally emotionally abused by their husbands under the auspices of this being what god expects from us um to not be um a man's equal but to just be um sex toys frankly and so, but they waited. They were all, they were all in the corner. I'm going, why are they in the corner? What are they doing? And they come over to me, and Hulda 
says, I don't do this very often, but you know, I really feel like I'm supposed to pray for you. We all feel like we're supposed to pray for you. And they were like, you know, do you have any, you know, space issues? I said, oh no, if you feel like you're supposed to pray, get in as close as you want, give it to me. I want the prayers, absolutely. And so they surrounded me, they put their hands on me. And I mean, the air was just buzzing. And if you've ever received really anointed prayer, you know what I'm talking about. And they all had their hands on me. I could feel the buzzing from the hands and, and it's just, and, and she's praying and she's praying over some things that I didn't even know I needed prayer for as far as calling and mission. And yet they make perfect sense now. And they actually really tie into a lot of the prayers that have been spoken over me or I mean, um, words have been spoken over me for like 20 years now since I was, I was a new believer and things that are just finally coming to fruition and making sense. And anyway, I felt like something had changed. Okay. And and they really blessed me. They called me auntie, which in the African-American community is such an honor. And I wanted to just cry right then and there. I didn't, I didn't, um, but I didn't take that lightly um, to be called auntie. And I mean, yes, I am that age. <laughs> I am. Um, but it was just, it was such a blessing and such a beautiful thing. And it's like, I, I cherish it. I treasure it. But um, rest of the conference went great. Um, got out of there the next day, spent from 8 a.m. to 2 the next morning in airports because, um, you know, flights have been being delayed and everything. But uh, it all worked out great because I was able to spend some more time with um, some people from the... Um, the conference, um, actually because my flights were delayed and that was really nice and, um, not like I needed to get home, but I was not nervous about the first flight because it was a short, it was just like a puddle jumper from Fort Hood's airport and clean to Dallas, Fort Worth. And so my eardrum was not going to have any problem. I had my gum ready. I had my earplugs ready. I had everything ready. And then on my three hour flight from Dallas to Idaho Falls, I wasn't having any problems with my ear at all. And I should have been because my eardrum had ruptured on, believe me, if you've had it happen, there's no saying, did my eardrum, you know, because it, it hurts. It's, it's quite a unique pain. And I'm on this three hour flight and I chewed one stick of gum and, you know, I took my earplug out. You know, it's, it's like, well, I'm not having any problems. And usually I will go through multiple packs of gum on a flight, just trying to get my ears stabilized. But I wasn't even having the level of trouble with my ears that I would have had before January because I've always had trouble with uh, with ear pressure always all my life it's just it had never actually ruptured until january and so not only was my eardrum not ruptured but it was something had happened where i wasn't having the lifetime problems i was having and i'd never really been prone to ear infections or anything so i never had them as a child as far as i know but i mean that's a miracle and it's even more so a miracle uh, because I was dumb and um, there was this walking path. And so Ryan White and I would get up before it got hot because, you know, he's from Minnesota and I'm from Idaho Falls. And we do not do hot and humid. And so we did the three mile trek. You know, a lot of people were doing that in the morning and, you know, just talking about things and um before it got too hot. But the first morning is like, oh my gosh, by the time we got done, we started too late. And like, we were both all sweaty and gross. And so I had to take a shower after the walk and I had forgotten about the ear and I got water in there and I could feel that water had gotten in behind the membrane. 
And so that was going to be really bad for the flight home because that was going to make it worse. And that was taken care of too. And so because these wonderful, lovely, lovely, loving ladies um, prayed for me and they obeyed, you know, the Holy Spirit and they did, my, my ear is better than it was before I went to the conference. And I just didn't have all those issues that I normally had. And, and, and here's the really weird thing. Okay. Usually like being in planes and on flights is very stressful for me, especially if there are babies crying. Um, I mean, not only am I nervous about my ears, but um, I've reached the age where the noise of babies crying and screaming and, and, and little girls squealing, you know, that sound. I've gotten to the point in my life where you get to my age and we start to lose our hearing and that sound actually is very painful. And so, you know, I'll get like really irritated didn't have any of that problem. And I actually had a baby in the seat behind me screaming <laughs> for a big part of the flight from Dallas to Idaho Falls. And it didn't bother me. I mean, it didn't feel great, but it didn't bother me and the kid, the, the poor kid. I mean, we were supposed to have flown out at eight. We, <laughs> we didn't fly out until after 11. And so this kid is poor thing, poor baby beyond inconsolable just you know needed to be home wasn't the mother's fault you know wasn't anybody's fault she tried to get him you know to sleep and be comfortable but he needed to be at home in bed so tired and just nonsensical at that point and um i was fine i was actually more concerned with the baby than for myself, you know, wasn't really thinking about how irritated I was, which is like awesome. And especially since the nervous breakdown, because um, it used to be the anxiety from that would just, rah, but now I was fine. And at the end of the flight, I was able to get up out of my seat and I turned to her to smile. And she says, I'm so sorry. And I said, oh, sweetheart, you know, <laughs> goodness sakes. I was actually just turning around to see if I could carry anything out for you, you know, because gosh, I had twins. And so I know, I know that they can, you know, they're, they can scream. Fortunately, mine never screamed on planes. I was very fortunate. My babies were the best travelers. Um, and that's where you get lucky. That's not something where you can train it. into. That's just, it's like, thank you, God. And, uh, anyway, no, it was great. It was great. And, um, you know, my, my friend list exploded again after, um, after the conference and I'm almost at 5,000 friends on Facebook right now. And it's, gosh, it was just such a blessing. And, uh, I, I did do a lot of sleeping the week after because I was so exhausted from just having, been preparing for so long and no I uh I'm glad I went and I never thought I would ever say I'm glad I went to a conference because usually it's the last thing I want to do being in a room full of people but you know God really set my mind at ease about traveling and about being able to deliver and being able to do speaking, um, it was just a real blessing. And I'm not going to say everything went perfect because of course, no, you know, not everything went perfectly, but I couldn't believe how well it went and how well I did with all the people around me. Um, you know, without having the anxiety issues and being able to have the downtime where I could go back to my room and, and just nap. Yeah, it was, it was more than I could have, you know, possibly even hoped for. Never thought, um, I would ever have such a good conference experience and I would actually go again. I would do it again without, you know, a second thought and you know, if, 
If Sarah puts on another search conference, I'll tell you something, ladies, go. Husbands, send your ladies. We were so unified all weekend. And of course, so the day after the conference, because everything was so spectacular, you know, everything goes to hell, <laughs> you know, and the enemy comes in with some very targeted attacks that were weird. <laughs> But, you know, it, it's okay. It's These things happen. It, it happens this way. It's, it's actually normal. And everything goes so well that you forget <laughs> that it's going to, okay, things are going to go wrong now. And you just kind of got to stay the course. It's like, okay, Lord, I just trust you to handle this. And I don't need to do much of anything. And, um, no, it was a good weekend. Anyway, um, I just wanted to kind of, share that with you. It was a weekend of miracles. It was a weekend of being with friends. Some I knew personally, others I had never met. And uh, gosh, you just have no complaints. I was so insanely, incredibly blessed by the whole thing. Mm. Real quick, wanted to let everybody know that um, my Context for Kids curriculum series, I have permanently reduced the price on Amazon for the hard copies to $15 a volume um, instead of the 20 that it, it used to be. And I only have Kindle on one of them. That's the first one. And I reduced that from $9.99 to um, $7.99. So I'm just trying to make it a lot more affordable so they can be used in um, in tandem with the Context for Kids radio show, um, and which is also in podcast form and in transcript for, form on contextforkids.com and on my Context for Kids YouTube channel and on my podcast channel. Um, I'm just really, really... It's very important to me more than ever to make sure that kids have um, access to as much as possible. Of course, um, all my radio program, it, it's, it's absolutely free. And I've got, what, 71 episodes now. And I'm getting toward the end of the series that um, I've been doing for the past eight weeks. Um, Helping kids with identity formation, what it means to be in Christ, um, to be defined by him, to be committed to him. And it's all in an effort to help kids um, kind of have a firm foundation so that they're not swept away by this gender identity crisis that's that's really such a problem with kids nowadays um, and believing kids, too. You know, believing kids are not immune to um, identity crisis. As a matter of fact, sometimes because of things we do, they experience it um, more. And so my goal with this has been to um, eliminate as much of that as possible. Obviously, nothing can, um, nothing can absolute, there is no silver bullet for saying that kids won't have these um, these identity issues, but we can do what we can to make sure that uh, we allow them to be who they are in ways that don't encourage confusion. That's probably a bad way of putting it. <laughs> but really, it, it's been on my heart for a long time the way kids are suffering these days because um, um, a lot of the expectations we put on them and we we will often inadvertently push them toward this sign of stuff instead of protecting them from it. But anyway, um, that's it for this week. Uh, next week, we're going to finish up Mark. And then the week after that, we're going to talk about some, um, some do's and don'ts of studying some ways to find good books, ways to avoid bad books, and the same with teachers, um, just in, in, in so many different ways. Um, like just because somebody has a doctor in front of their name doesn't mean that they've got a doctorate in what 
they're teaching. You know, you can have a doctorate in meteorology <laughs> from your own, um, the own the university you set up through your church and <laughs> teaching Bible. And it's kind of like, okay, you're, you've got your doctorate in meteorology, but you're, that doesn't mean you know anything more than a layman. Like, I have my degree in chemistry, but that doesn't mean that it's the same as having a degree in biblical studies. Okay. Like I always say, I'm not a scholar. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a historian. I just pretend to be one on the radio. <laughs> anyway, I will. I will see you next week. Bye.